Thank you, Scott, for those remarks. Um, and I have to say, since I have a chance here, it has been just extraordinary for us at RPA to have Scott Reckler become the chairman of RPA, uh, lead us through the completion of the fourth regional plan, and really transform this organization in so many ways. So Scott, thank you so much for what you've done for the last five years. It's been incredible. Um, and somebody will have some very, very, very big shoes to fill. So it's a thrill for me this, this afternoon to be here with Governors Hochul and Murphy and an opportunity to talk about the way the two of you are collaborating on a number of issues across the region. I will ask a question later about Gateway, I promise, but maybe before we get on that, which because you know all my staff will say when I start talking about Gateway, I never stop. Um, so before I do that, maybe I could just ask you a couple other questions about some of the issues that you both have been working on. And, and I gotta say from RPA's perspective, the way the two of you have been collaborating and thinking about the entire region, and not just New York and New Jersey, but really the Northeast and, and the role that this region plays, um, I think, in the entire United States. And so maybe the first issue I'd like to talk about would just be to, to kind of tee up um, a little bit of a conversation about climate change. Of course, in New York, we have extraordinarily ambitious uh, plans in place and goals in place for 70% renewable electricity, 100% um, carbon free. Everyone knows Governor Murphy also, not just that you are a strong proponent of this, but your wife, Tammy Murphy, has been seen as one of the national leaders on this issue. Uh, so we know that that issue hits close to home for you also. Um, just, I think it was a few weeks ago, you both did an event with uh, the Interior Secretary, Deb Holland, to kind of announce an auction for uh, offshore wind leases. Um, that, that uh, ended up leading to almost $4 billion worth of investment for offshore wind. Extraordinary movement and, and, and development in this area. And yet, we know that we've got a lot further to go. We don't have the offshore wind in the ground yet. It's not just about flipping on a switch or anything else like that. So still really, in many ways, the big challenges are in front of us. Um, maybe, Governor Hochul, if I could start with you, kind of, how do you see, what do you see as the next steps that New York needs to take in this area? And especially as we have these electrification goals that are so ambitious, what do you see, how do you see that moving forward? Your question is, are we gonna meet those goals? I know, <laughs> yes. I know it's behind the question, Tom. And first of all, congratulations on 100 years. It's not lost on me that this organization was founded just a few short years after the last global pandemic brought this area to its knees. So you've been there transforming this state for over 100 years, but you've been there at the times when we needed you the most. So thank you. Thanks, Scott Reckler, for amazing leadership and your unbounding optimism about this area. And I, and I share that as well. And I, I'm going to give a quick shout out to two people that are involved in my operations. Uh, Jana Lieber, I think, is joining us here, if he's not here already, but we've done extraordinary things together uh, with his work at the MJ and, and Rick Cotton, our executive director of the Port Authority, superstars, I know talent when I see it, and also Catherine Garcia, the head of state operations. So, so these are the people you want to get to know and work with. Uh, uh, yeah, climate change, when you think about it, we're the first generation really feeling the impacts of climate change and we're the last generation that can do something about it because too much time has already passed. Uh, this is my uh, upbringing speaking. I grew up in the shadow of the steel plants of Lackawanna, New York, where my dad and grandpa worked making steel. And I always thought that the skies were supposed to be orange <laughs> because that's what we always saw, the clouds of orange smoke billowing out of the smokestacks, as well as the pollution that was dumping into one of our great freshwater lakes, Lake Erie, where believe it or not, we actually swam in that water. So I've been an environmentalist since my birth. Uh, I have no choice but to see what we can do to protect our environment. That being said, when I became governor, we were talking about two bold opportunities, and I'll get to offshore wind in a second, but we needed to figure out how to replace the electricity for New York City. We have found a way to bring transmission lines in from Delaware County, wind and solar, as well as, and this is what I say as well as, I was presented with the choice. The RFP narrowed it down to two options. The clean path in from the Catskills, or do you bring in transmission lines down the Champlain Trail hydroelectric power from Quebec, projects I knew a lot, deal, a great deal about. 
the option was one or the other. And I said, no, we don't have time to wait. We will do both at the same time. So that bold statement, as well as 100 renewable projects around the state, plus our investment, uh, nation-leading investment in offshore wind, we will achieve 63% of our goal. We'll hit 63% very shortly when those come online by 2027. So our goal of having 70% renewables by 2030, we're going to hit it. So we're, we're, we're bold, we're ambitious, and we know we have no time to lose. Oh, thank you so much. That's, yeah, that, I, I, of course, we were really pleased to support you in that and to be out campaigning for that. Governor Murphy. Tom, I, I echo Kathy's congratulations to you and Scott and the team on, your, on all the great work you do in a 100-year anniversary. Let me also say this. It's not a coincidence that we're here on stage together. We each looked at the program. We saw that we were coming in one after the other, and we each reached out to each, each other and said, no, we want to make a statement. We're on the stage together. The relationship between New York and New Jersey has never been stronger, period. Right. I'll be brief. We face many of the same challenges that New York does, particularly downstate. Uh, offshore wind, we're the most densely populated state in America. You can't get a gentleman's sea on the environment and on climate change. It's a pass-fail reality for us. We have a 100% clean energy goal by mid-century and several stops along the way. A big part of it is offshore wind. We've got a 7,500 megawatt program that we're in the midst of executing on. Uh, we've got an, enor an entire re review and renewal of our solar uh, incentives, whole range of things. Environmental justice is really important to us. Uh, as we all know, urban communities, particularly black and brown communities, historically have been ravaged disproportionately. Uh, by pollution because plants got stuck there because other folks wouldn't take them. Uh, I think we have the strongest environmental justice law in America. And last, uh, on that long list of things that we work so closely on, the New York Bite auction that you referenced is something that we're both in uh, together 100%. The results were terrific, uh, and it's a good indication, a good leading indication of uh, the excitement around the offshore wind reality for both states. Thank you so much. It is really exciting to see you working there. And, and Governor, I, I will say again, it's just so wonderful to have the two of you on stage. I think it sends a powerful message to the entire region and the nation about, about the way this, this region is really aligned and how we work together. Let's switch to talk a little bit about another issue that's a traditional RPA concern, which is community development and housing. You know, in the Great Recession of 2008, our housing production essentially fell off a cliff. And while the economy came back, and in other parts of the country, housing production came back, it has lagged that level ever since here in the tri-state metropolitan region, which as our economy grows, is just growing a, a larger and larger imbalance, which we're all seeing in the crisis of affordability that shows up in the poll results that we see and everything else. We see this, of course, as a regional housing market. All aspects, all elements of the region have to be working together. Um, but somehow it's been really hard because it's kind of a, you know, it's one of these issues where there's the public sector and the private sector working together, and of course there's state and local government, all of which have to come into alignment to make some progress in this area. Now, we kind of think it's fairly obvious where housing should go in the region. It should go where we have infrastructure, where we have transit and development to try and support it. Uh, and so we've been supporting transit-oriented development and um, accessory dwelling units and other strategies around that. But it's a hard slog, and, and we get a lot of opposition to it. I want to give a, a tip of the hat to, to Sarah Bronin in Desegregates Connecticut, which has been a partner for us in Connecticut working on this issue. Um, both of you have really kind of challenged and, and taken on this issue. Governor Hochul, you, with your latest budget first, really made a proposal to go out there and talk about incentivizing transit-oriented development and accessory dwelling units, but there was a lot of local pushback around that. Governor Murphy in New Jersey, there's the tradition, of course, between the Mount Laurel Doctrine, which kind of provides the builder's remedy if communities are refusing to do that. And of course, I have to mention also, we have this thing in New Jersey called the State Development and Redevelopment Plan with a State Planning Commission, which provides that kind of role negotiating between the state and the counties and municipalities about where growth should and shouldn't go. So we have, we have some tools there too. But 
we're still really confronting uh, a lot of challenges in this area. Can I ask both of you how you see this issue, what kind of engagement you're having with the communities, and how you see us kind of moving forward on this? Uh, and Governor Hochul, I'll ask you. Yes, I, I did attempt this in our budget, but I also learned that sometimes it takes a little bit of time for people's attitudes to change and the hearts and minds of people to understand the value of a proposition. So, so we're not done. I just want to say that, but also we do have an affordability crisis. I mean, the crisis has been exacerbated by COVID. We know that. And I find it just deeply sad that people cannot grow up. They grow up in a community and they have to leave when they want to raise their own children because they can't afford their old neighborhood. Therefore, grandparents, and this is personal to me now as well, they can't be close to the families they want to, and it's no fault to their own. We're also we're hemorrhaging a lot of young people from places like Long Island and Westchester that are very expensive, and they want to stay, but they say, I can't afford to live here. So we understand the severity of the problem. That's why my budget put $25 billion, largest investment in affordable housing in the history of the state of New York. That'll result in 100,000 new units in addition to 10,000 supportive units. I mean, there's so many people, whether it's uh, people with substance abuse problems, our veterans, uh, LGBTU, elderly individuals, I've opened housing for them as well, as well as people with mental health challenges. They need supportive housing as well. But also, as you mentioned, the ADUs. This came to light as I was walking the streets of East Elmhurst after Hurricane Ida, literally my on the job about a week. And I saw the devastation of people who lived in subhuman conditions, literally flooded out of their homes and lost their lives. I said, something has to be done. So we looked at it and having ADUs and people living there anyhow brought into compliance just seemed like the right thing to do. So this is something that there's probably more of an appetite for in the city right now. I want to give them that authority. I also come out of local government. I think that the state has way too much power over some of these decisions. I personally don't want to be deciding where red light cameras go in school zones. I think cities should worry about yes, that. Yes, so thank you. Is, you know, we have enough to worry about. So there's so many things I want to transition back to cities, and one of them is to determine this kind of control. So we're going to keep investing in this, working with communities, as well as incentivizing it. A lot of our, uh, our favorite projects were on Konkama Hub out in Long Island. I mean, that was incentivized by regional economic development dollars. So that's the other thing. Local governments will give you money to make it happen, and that might be what they need. Yeah, thank you so much for those comments. Governor. Tom, I'd say affordability is center stage on everything we do. Um, every state has a bumper sticker. Our bumper sticker is the number one state in America to raise a family. If that's your bumper sticker, uh, that doesn't come free. It doesn't come cheap. So we've historically had uh, a big uh, affordability challenge. I'm proud that our administration is at the lowest four and now with our submitted budget, it'll be five years in a row of the lowest property tax increases on record. We have a huge property tax relief program uh, in the budget. By the way, I'm listening to Kathy. You can look at a budget as either a big stack of numbers or, uh, frankly, what it really is, it screams out your values. What do you really care about? Uh, and in our case, and I think it's yours as well, we, cared about, we care about affordability and opportunity. One other example for us is we've got a huge investment uh, to clean out the entirety of the backlog of the Mount Laurel units that have not yet been built. 3,300 3, uh, units. Yeah. Uh, that's going to get cleaned out by the end of our, our second term. And lastly, you mentioned, I know the clock is not our friend here, you mentioned transit uh, villages and transit development. Diane Scacchetti is with us, the chair of NJ Transit, also our commissioner of the Department of Transportation, and that has become a huge priority for us. You know, developing smartly around those transit stops is a potential game changer for us. We see that exactly the same way. I have to say that the wonderful staff at RPA is part of our fourth regional plan. We did a kind of 10,000 foot analysis of what would happen if you just did infill development within a half mile of commuter rail stations at appropriate scales and densities. And we estimated you could create 250,000 housing units 
within a 10 minute walk of a commuter rail station and most of that land is publicly owned. Most of it is owned by the MTA or New Jersey Transit or, or, or local municipalities. So, so there are huge opportunities there and we're very excited to work with both of you to continue to work on, on, on this issue. Maybe kind of pivoting from that to mass transit, if I can, um, you've both been enormous supporters of, of transit through your careers. I think, Governor Murphy, you really said during your first uh, run for office, you know, uh, you will judge me on how I do with New Jersey Transit, and we have Commissioner Scacchetti and Kevin Corbett here, uh, and you've been, I, I think Kevin's over there at the table. There we go. I didn't see Kevin. Kevin, apologies. <laughs> and you've been enormously supportive of them, and then uh, Governor Hochul, you, and Jana Lieber, and, and we're very pleased to have um, several folks from the MTA here today, too. Uh, uh, Jamie Torres Springer in Construction and Development, Rich Davey, the new head of the Transit Authority here, uh, and so you've both been real supporters of, of mass transit through your administrations and continuing to, um, to do that. Um, now, COVID, of course, has created huge disruptions in that service and you know, ridership declined by over 90%. It's starting to come back, but it's still slow. Uh, it's, putting, it's putting operating pressure on, on the agencies, even as we see that the tolled crossings, uh, automotive crossings are above where they were in, in 2019. And so we're gonna have a lot of pressure on these systems and continuing to try and move forward with them. And I, I will say from our perspective, the goal here is to try and have the best regional transportation system, mobility system in the world. Because that's what, that's what New York and New Jersey and Connecticut ought to have. Um, where do you guys see mass transit next? What do you kind of, what, what are the next priorities that you want to do with those systems? And, and how do you see that going forward? Well, I'm very, very grateful to have, first of all, a president who understands how important infrastructure is. Let's get that out there. And we're very, very fortunate to have the majority leader of the United States Senate, our own Chuck Schumer. So that's the, uh, the double whammy we needed to have that kind of money. I served in Congress and we could barely get a dime for infrastructure. And that, you know, when I served with Moynihan as a staffer back in the 80s, nobody fought over infrastructure. That was the one thing other than maybe a farm bill where there was bipartisan support. So to get that over the finish line allows the state of New York to have the most ambitious, boldest ca five-year capital plan, again, in our history, $32.8 billion for infrastructure and mass transit being a large part of that. And our own budget has a 25% increase in mass transit statewide. We also know, what are we gonna do to get people back using the subways? They have to be come back. I'm really proud today to announce that we hit a post-pandemic pandemic record. We have 3.5 million riders today, which is the highest, 3.5 million. Thank you, riders. Thank you, New Yorkers for coming back, uh, 3.5 million. We haven't had that number since March 14, 2020. So we're coming back, we're coming back. But first of all, we suspend any fare increases to give people that sense, you know, as they're losing more money in their pocketbooks because of inflation, we do what we can to help you. Also, people have to feel safe. You have to feel safe. You're not going to take your stroller on there. You're not going to let your child go on there. You're not going to want to commute to work every day. You're not going to go on uh, on the weekends for entertainment. So we are laser focused on the safety aspects of this. Uh, Mayor Adams and I, his first week on the job, we were in the subway talking about our shared commitment. Again, you talk about partnerships. Uh, uh, this is easy for us. Right. You know, we have a shared interest. For some reason, there always hasn't been that friendliness between a governor and a mayor of New York. <laughs> so when we talk about changing things you know, for the better, you know, we have that relation. We bring our resources together to help with the homeless, give them dignity of a place over their heads, but also to make sure we have enough people in there patrolling and making sure people feel safe. So we are turning the corner. I really feel it, and I, I'm really confident. But also in terms of other major projects, uh, Pan Access, uh, what we're doing to bring in our commuters through that, East Side Access, um, uh, the Interborough Express. Interborough. Interborough Express, thank you for the great idea, RPA, thank you. Yeah, I just like, these ideas are so brilliant, let's get it done, and so, uh, you know, we're gonna get that done. The Second Avenue Subway, how many times have I been in that subway? I've gone into, uh, uh, down below, it's uh, Congressman Espayat, he's very excited about this, and so uh, we, we have so much on our plate, but the good news is, 
we have the money to fund them. And we have a very aggressive governor who's holding everybody accountable saying, when is it due? Okay, shave off six months, shave off six months. And so we're gonna get it done. And I, I really look forward to continuing to work together on our, our shared objective to make sure that this region has world-class public transportation systems. That's wonderful, thank you so yeah. much. The governor. Amen to all of that. I've been saying now for four and a half years, we're gonna fix NJ Transit if it kills me, and it might. Um, <laughs> the fact that I'm here today is a good sign. Uh, I'm alive, uh, and that's because we're fixing it. The, the, the wreck within the wreck that we inherited four and a half years ago is NJ Transit. They didn't have enough engineers. The equipment, rolling stock and otherwise, was way out of date. The customer service uh, was lousy. Um, Stations were way past their sell-by date. Just one thing after another. And Kevin and Diane and their teams uh, have done an extraordinary job. Our, our investments have been at records now, five budgets in a row. Like Kathy, we've had now, we're gonna have five years of no fare increases. The prior administration fare, fares went up 36%, and it's fair to say the rider experience did not go up 36%. Uh, it is vital, again, if you're the most densely populated state in the nation, which we are, in the most densely populated region in the nation, the one thing you've got to get right is infrastructure, and especially bus and rail, uh, and we're getting it right. Thank you. I, uh, you remind me, Governor Murphy, I think it was Ben Franklin famously said, New Jersey is a keg tapped at both ends. And it's just, you know, it's an infrastructure corridor, and, it's, and, and the future of the state really is that investment. And Governor Hochul, I, I just, you know, on behalf of everybody at RPA, uh, especially seeing you jump on the Interborough Express idea and the team at the MTA take that and move that because it's it's such a wonderful we're, we're seeing the projects coming forward and just a few weeks ago we had an opportunity to go down into the, the uh, east side access station and get a little preview maybe I'm not supposed to say that publicly but uh, it is if you haven't been down there the next time anybody here is in Grand Central just look down at your feet and think that a hundred feet below you there's a brand new station that's been carved out of the bedrock that'll open at the end of this year, completely changing the, the economic geography. And what both of you are doing is making those long-term investments so it's not just a kind of bubble, but it's always continuing improvements, which is really, really what we need to see. Well, then this maybe is a wonderful opportunity to seg to the project that, that is so near and dear to all of our hearts, which is the Gateway Project which really did for, for four years was kind of suffering under a lot of pushback from Washington. I think uh, it became unnecessarily a, a political chess piece. You're being um, polite. <laughs> yeah, I try, to, I try to be diplomatic on, on all these things. I take my cues from Tony Kosha. Um, but um, uh, so it's, it's always been a huge priority for us. Uh, I have the scars on my back. I went down with the ship on the ARC project. I was trying to get people to sign petitions 12 years ago to keep Governor Christie from canceling that project. Then the tunnels get flooded during Stu Superstorm Sandy. And everything that's been happening in this region, I think, points to the, the, the greater and greater need for doing this. We now has, if you, uh, have, as you both said, um, you know, a president who cares about this. And many of the folks in the audience might have been here five years ago when, at the time, former Vice President Biden was the keynote speaker at the RPA Assembly, and he stood up at the podium, and literally his opening words were, I'm Joe Biden, and I love trains. And the room just exploded. Uh, uh, so, so this is something, and even just the poll that we produced last week shows 80% support for the Gateway Project. So there's enormous need, opportunity, and support for this. And I think that you have uh, an announcement today about the project, and I'd like to give you a chance, maybe Governor Hochul, to, to key that off. Well, thank you, and no project goes very far without exceptional leadership. And we knew with the Gateway Development Corporation we needed to find a leader who is battle-tested, who knows how to get his hands on the money, uh, get the resources out of Washington. And so in the spirit of, of uh, bi-state collaboration, we're picking a New Jersey guy. Uh, Chris Kalari is gonna be the CEO of Gateway Development Corporation. So that's our announcement today. I'm sure you have something. Yeah, listen, I, uh, we, we are nominating uh, jointly Chris Kalari um, and I, th I think I can speak for both of us. We couldn't be happier to be the chief executive officer of the Gateway Development Corporation. 
Chris, as many of you know, is the former commissioner of the Department of Transportation, among many other uh, hats he's worn over the years in New Jersey, but with deep relations on the, the New York side of the Hudson, uh, a, a long history of working with the likes of Tony Kosha and, and Rick and, and, and his predecessors. Um, I think this is a exactly the right guy for the right moment, for the right position. As Kathy said, you don't go many places unless you have a CEO, uh, and this is the guy we're nominating. I think we, we, we could not be more excited about this. Big day for GDC. Thanks. We're very excited to be working with Chris. I think everybody in this room is, is, he is thrilled about that. Chris couldn't make it. I, I, I reached out to him. I've known him a long time and applaud you on that choice and really look forward. I, I think on behalf of Regional Plan Association, we're all just here to help push forward and implement this project, which is such a, a huge priority. Um, okay, so I've got time for one last question. And, and maybe since it is our centennial and we're a long-term planning organization, can I ask both of you about your long-term plans? Governor Murphy, you were just re-elected the first Democrat re-elected to a second term of governor in New Jersey since Brendan Byrne, uh, quite old, 44 years ago, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so, so pretty historic there. Governor Hochul, you are obviously up this year and are, 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 are going to be facing an election. But if I can ask both of you, and you, of course, have had to put together an administration, you know, put together a team, pass a budget, you know, and then, and then run for office all within, what, a couple of hours, it seemed, you know. So, but both of you uh, are working so well on these issues. Can I ask you kind of, what do you want to be remembered for 25, 50 years from now? What are the issues that you would like to see as your legacy uh, to the citizens of your states, to the region, to the nation? Because I think both of you have the opportunity to be, well, I want to push you to think about that or talk about that a little bit. Where would you like to see? What would you like people to think about and remember you for? Well, thank you. I haven't thought about it that far, but uh, trying to get to every single day. However, there is an opportunity here. I do believe that history will judge us about what, by what we do in this moment, how we came through this pandemic, or were we knocked back on our knees and it took decades to recover, I say no, our legacy will be that we join together, working collaboratively, working in as a unified, cohesive force going forward. And I want also my legacy to be not just pulling this community back and reinvigorating and bringing people back from their homes and making, making our downtowns just feel so vibrant again. We're missing that human connection. But also I want us to still be remembered as a place where progressive values are enshrined the women's rights movement started in New York. We also had the right to abortion three years before Roe v. Wade, so we're gonna continue fighting to protect those rights that we hold dear. We're the birthplace of the LGBTQ movement. We're protecting those rights. So on top of building our way out of this and lifting up people with historic investments in education and childcare and healthcare as our budget does, we're not going to cede our mantle as that beacon of hope to states all over this country who are under leaders who don't respect their human rights. And that is how we're laying down the gauntlet right now and saying, you don't mess with New York, but we're gonna be looking out for our brothers and sisters across the nation as well. Thank you. I love that. Yeah. Amen. I love that. You mentioned Brendan Byrne. Brendan Byrne is like the Yogi Berra. They both had took their last breath, by the way, in New Jersey. Um, one of Byrne's great lines, remember they had the Brendan Byrne Arena, and then it all of a sudden wasn't the Brendan Byrne Arena? This is a Brendan line. Turns out I was immortal for 15 years. <laughs> um, I, I think it is, Tom, in our case, that I hope people look back and say, you know what, these guys came in and fixed the place. New Jersey used to be a model that other states looked to. When one of my mentors, Governor Kane, was governor, we were a AAA bond-rated state. Um, we just got our first two upgrades back to back in 44 years as well, by the way. Um, whether it's the, a, a, an economy that grows, some of the equity uh, s steps that Kathy talked about, um, whether it's, you know, reducing your debt, making your pension payment, investing at record levels in infrastructure. I think infrastructure is high on that list. It isn't Democratic or Republican. You look in the mirror and ask, what kind of hand did you get dealt? Be honest with yourself, and then when you figure it out, play the damn hand. 
In our case, it's talent and location. Just back the truck up, focus laser-like on talent and location, and good things will happen. I, I just want to reiterate something that Kathy said. Um, it, apparently, five members of a right-wing Supreme Court have declared war on the American woman, and that's exactly what this is, and leaders like Governor Hochul and I and many in this room will not relent. If this is war, we will fight it and we will win it. Thank you. Governors, thank you so much for being here today to help celebrate RPA Centennial. It's a great honor for us to have two extraordinary public servants here to join us, and thank you for everything that you're doing for the citizens of, these, of our states and region. Thank you.